I'll press that. Okay, recording. Mark, how you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm all right. I stopped you from chatting a moment ago because uh, you was you, you was kind of documenting your meltdown over over choosing these <laughs> records. So so before we even get on with any of this, just tell me about that process and did it really fry your brain? Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so you you got in touch. I don't know when. Just June or something was it? Maybe a couple um, months ago. Yeah. Oh yeah, a couple of months ago. And um, yeah. So ever since then. Um, uh, because it's your questions that I mean, and I, I hadn't heard of your podcast um, until you got in touch. And as soon as you got in touch, I went away and listened to Chuck D straight off because I'm a massive Public Enemy fan, and um, and that was me. So I've listened to about I don't know maybe thirty ish of them so far. Oh, okay. People I know mostly. Um, uh, so you know Tony Pitts, I, I texted you after listening to Tony, and um, and I but I love I love hearing other people's choices. And uh, and I've got so much out of it as well, you know. I've I've found new um, bands. I've found new songs from that I'd never heard from bands that I know. So it's been great. It's like a, it's like a desert island discs, but a bit better, you know. Oh, I'll um, take that, mate. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, it was it was it was it was horrendous trying to juggle. Uh, or, or because it changes on a daily basis what you kind of especially the uh, well the intro one also the sort of you know your school years one and also your clubbing one I mean not that I'm a, I was ever a clubber but um, I certainly there was a, a club we went out to regularly um, but I, songs kept coming back to me about that you know but I just thought well I'll choose the ones that are the most the ones that I remember you know um the most or that sort of stand out the most from any particular given moment rather than trying to condense it you know so i chose secondary school rather than primary school because there was a few songs at primary school you know that i could have chosen but um but no it was hugely enjoyable albeit intensely frustrating (laughs) good good that's what i want (laughs) Well, let's let, let's get the ball rolling because there's quite a few honourable mentions for this one, and and this is generally always the one that people struggle the most with. Uh, and so, Mark, the I, song with the greatest ever intro, please. Uh, well, this is the one that changed the most uh, up and changed again last night, and then changed back. But <laughs> since the very since the very beginning, this is one of the first ones I thought of. And um, it's uh, it's a song called West End Blues by uh, Louis Armstrong, um, which has only been sort of in my um, field of musical vision for about 12 years. I think I did a, a one man show in the West End um, uh, in 2008 um, called Novacento. And it was about a jazz trumpeter who was telling the story of his friend who was the pianist in the band that they played on in this uh, ocean liner. They were on an ocean liner that went back, that went back and forth to Europe uh, between uh, Europe and New York. And uh, his friend had been born on the ship and left on the ship. And he'd been sort of adopted by the crew and he grew up and they named him Danny Budman T.D. Lemon Novacento. That was his name, hence the title of the play. Um, but in preparation for watching, uh, for, for playing that part, I watched this brilliant series um, called Jazz by uh, Ken Burns, made by Ken Burns, um, which was on PBS. Um, it was made in about 2001. And... It, it just took you through the whole history. And I hadn't, I was t- totally ignorant of, of jazz, really. Um, but it took you from 1917, right up until present day. And um, and about the evolution, about how it started, and about who were the sort of, you know, who were the sort of forerunners of the sound, that particular sound, and how it all came together, you know, from different musical influences. And um, this song, West End Blues, um, was uh, often quite often songs where uh, they played snippets of songs in the documentary, but this one they played in its entirety. It's only like three minutes eighteen or something, uh, because the uh, what's his name, Winton Marsalis, who's a, a jazz trumpeter, he talked about this song in such a beautiful way. 
he said that he he played it to his tutor one day. He'd found it somewhere, I don't know, an old pressing of it or something, and he played it to his his trumpet tutor. And he said he just he said he sat there in silence. Um, and as soon as it finished, he kind of looked up at him with tears in his eyes and said, put it on again. And uh, I just thought that was such a kind of wonderful way of describing what it did to that guy, you know, yeah. who had been a jazz tutor all his life. And the, the, the intro itself has about five different time signatures mm. in it, you know, because Louis Armstrong was an absolute fucking genius, you know. What he did with that and with that instrument and with his his vocal instrument mm. as well and both sometimes at the same time and I think what's wonderful about the whole song is that it kind of encompasses ev almost every human experience I feel when I listen to it and I listen to it on a regular basis that song um, it just encompasses everything that is about being a human being you know it's wonderful. And so did that kind of open the doors, you know, that 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 gig as as well as that track to to jazz? Because I don't know about you, but jazz is something that I've kind of started to explore as I've got older. It wasn't yeah. some it wasn't on my radar when when I was twenty one. Uh, no, it just not. felt like something that I, I just kind of, I don't know if you, you know, you have to be of a certain age to start to kind of appreciate <laughs> jazz. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it, I think it's the, it's jazz and country are the two things that approach 100%. you. <laughs> as you get, as you get uh, into your later years, you suddenly start listening to Emmy Lou Harris and going, do you know what? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, with, with that in mind, Let's let's talk about the honourable mentions because to go from something right. that that kind of you know starts to chime into your life in you know as you start to hit your forties etc. I mean, faith no more is from out of nowhere. I mean, that's taking the roof off when you're eighteen, right? Yeah. Yeah. And oh, absolutely. Uh, I and I went to see them uh, in oh Christ, uh, um, ninety. Two maybe or ninety one um, at the Battlelands in Glasgow. They're, they've been one of my favourite bands for uh, since time immemorial. I think I can't remember when I got into them. Heavy metal was my first love. ACDC yeah. was my first gig, right? Um, and but Faith No More came along probably around about the time the real thing was released, which was I think eighty nine. Mm, it was eighty nine. I mean, when you still listen to that album now, and you go, what? There's not a there's not a song on it that sounds yeah. okay, you know? It's an incredible piece of work. I mean, and he's an incredible artist, Mike Patton, I think. Man, like, let's not overlook his vocals. They're oh, incredible, mate. Yeah. Like, and the, the band, I mean, I've, I forged a good friendship uh, with, with, with um, a guy called Jason Perry, who, who, who was a singer in a band called A, uh, who, who come on this podcast. And afterwards, we, we were sitting here, this was pre-pandemic, this is me little kind of garden bar like type studio. So we were sitting having a, having a, a little beer. And, uh, and we started talking about From Out of Nowhere. And he went, oh, do you like Faith No More? I went, I think there's a double snare in that, in that intro where it just goes, bop, bop, da -da -da -da. <laughs> and he went, that's the greatest snare ever. And we literally <laughs> just sat there drinking this beer, infusing about this, fucking snare drum on from out of nowhere and and yeah it's it's incredible that track and the energy that that record's got yeah like still holds up i i still dj in my 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 alternative club and you still drop that now and you get a reaction from 18 year old kids that have probably no yeah, idea who yeah. faith no more are but yeah as a, as a band you know it, it, even moving forwards like the what Angel Dust done for music was just oh, pioneering. Like yeah. I'd never heard anything like that before, and you know that no, paved the way for so many bands. I thought, and again, his vocals on that, you know, his the the fact that, and I think that's where he because he was very young when they did uh, the real thing, wasn't he? Mm. And I, I think on by the time Angel Dust came round, he'd really kind of uh, found his. <laughs> whatever it is he is you know but he you know on on songs like um uh, not caffeine what's the one where he goes yeah i swear a lot what's that called again um <laughs> Kinder, uh where he adopts that character you know yeah. that, uh, so, you know all that stuff is really 
fucking fascinating yeah. and and brilliant and weird and and uh, 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 quite arresting. You know, you, it takes you by surprise. Uh, yeah. So the guy, yeah, I, I absolutely love Faith No More. They're, they're yeah. uh, and still surprising now. And all the stuff, the other stuff he does. I mean, Mister Bungle, I've never quite. Uh, I've tried and I've tried. <laughs> Same here, mate. Same here, mate. <laughs> there's something just a bit too sort of proggy. I'm not yeah. a proggy at all. Same. And there's a, something just a bit too kind of like, you know. It's awkward, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I'd, it, it, it would take a lot more time than I've got to. Yeah. You know, it, to, it, it, was, it, was, it was them. It was Mr. Bungle. All of my mates were all into like all of the stuff that was going on then. James Addiction, Faith No More, all of that yeah. stuff. And we loved all that scene. And then there'd be the ones that took it the extra extra length and was like uber nerds for it. And they were the ones that were always talking about Mr. Bungle and Primus. And they were uh, the two bands that I couldn't get my head around. I, I saw was... Primus. And I saw Primus support James Addiction, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, and they uh, again at Battlelands, and uh, yeah, I, I've never I, I bought um, Seas of Cheese. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> stupid even saying that, but they're they I mean they're another kind of, you know, if you venture too far down that road, you go to um, you go to what's that band's name? Fishbone. Uh, no, I was going to say ha, 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 is it, it's not House of Pain. It's not that. Um, oh God. Do you know that band that did the auditions for the drummer? Uh, they, they auditioned about five drummers. What, what the fuck are they called? They're like proper, like heavy prog. It's weird. They're, uh, oh, what are they called? Fuck, this is what every conversation like with me <laughs> like this now. <laughs> so am I, Since mate. I was about 45. <laughs> it, it's what like, happens. It's what? the guy that plays with that <laughs> thingy band. They're on that programme. That's exactly, funny. that comes hand in hand with jazz and country, that mate. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's the repetition with jazz and country. That's what appeals to me. <laughs> um, what were the other honourable mentions um, that you had, Mark? Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Bob and Earl Harlem Shuffle, because I think that is one of the all time great. And I, I, I knew it before it became um, um, Jump Around. Yeah. Um, and it, it, as as often happens with fantastic pieces of music that are nicked for other fantastic pieces of music, it spoils the original for a long, yeah. long time, or it, or it spoils people's kind of um, getting, you know, because that's the very, very top of the song. Yeah. So for years, people were like, "Jump around!" No, it's not fucking jump around. <laughs> Listen to this, because Harlem Shuffle is the most kind of beautiful um i don't know what the best but sultry kind of sexy oh i just i love what it does to me when i'm listening to it it's got you know such a I groove mean? in it oh it's kind of that it's that kind of lazy groove kind of like mm. um it's kind of like superstition or something you know where yeah. it's just kind of like in you and you're like oh what's happening to me you know <laughs> um, Back in the day, obviously not now. But, yeah, you know, of course. Uh, but it, it kind of affects you. It affects you inside. It kind of does. It works wonders for your yeah. interior movement. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we... Yeah, I love that. Was that all the honourable mentions I, I had? Was there one more? Let me. I'm not. Let me just double check. Oh, my. Uh, oh, I've got mine here as well. Uh, oh no, there's another one. Richard Jobson and his and his merry men. Oh, do you know what? <laughs> And they'll cut a bit, well, Stuart Adamson will come up a bit later on. Of but, course, um, yeah. But that uh, that was one of the first songs I remember uh, uh, on top of the pops. Um, sort of, um, you know, um, you know, when you're watching, well, when you used to watch Top of the Pops and something, uh, that song came on that really kind of made you go, huh, uh, when you're wee, you know, when I, I would have been, Oh, I don't know. What was it? 70, 70, 78? 78, it, I would have thought, world? maybe. So I would have been 10. Um, uh, so um, it, it really kind of, I think there was, there, was there was a Generation X, there was Mirror in the Bathroom, 
and into the valley where the three songs I remember slapping me across the face. Yeah, I was too. I was just too young for punk. I was, I you know, maybe two or three years older, and I would have been like fucking at the front. But yeah, um, but I, it just passed me by. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, that I remember watching that or hearing that. And just being kind of like, holy shit. And I think it's just got one of the best kind of like call to arms type intros, you know? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And Jobson's performance on Top of the Pops. I mean, I've seen that a fair few times now. He's doing that kind of weird sort of kicking dance, isn't he? And he just <laughs> yeah. looks so frenzied. It's just brilliant. Yeah. yeah. What and, and, and the fact, well, I, I just realised I said a call to arms, but I mean, the, the, the subject matter for, for a... For a what was he 17 or 18 or maybe yeah. younger when he wrote that is an incredible uh, achievement for a, a really young boy, you know, yeah. to be savvy enough to, I mean, I know he was reading a lot of, of those kind of uh, history books and stuff at the time. Uh, I can't remember. There was one in particular that he's mentioned in interviews that he was reading. Um, and I can't remember what it was, but, um, but yeah, for that to come out the mouths of a, a young boy is, yeah. is incredible. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, and also it has us. It has it keeps coming up bizarrely on you know how Spotify runs. If you run over a playlist that you've got, it'll start just playing whatever yeah. is in connection, and that keeps coming up all the time just now. It's bizarre. It's like it's yeah. kind of I don't know what it's trying to do to me, but um, oh, it's a belter of a tune though, Mark. It's a it's a beauty, isn't it? Um, well, let's, yeah, yeah. Go on. Let's take you back. And uh, uh, first song you remember uh, hearing had an emotional impact on you, please, mate. Okay. Um, this was, uh, I think, only probably a year after Jobston. But, um, uh, and it's in, it's, it's uh, well, I'll tell you what it is first. <laughs> it's Union City Blue by Blondie. And this almost was my favourite intro. Um, this bit back and forth and back and forth. Because I think it's just, I mean, apart from being an incredible song, the intro is just fucking, oh my God. And it's, it's, uh, it's forever kind of linked because I think the first time again I saw that or heard the song was on top of the pops. Oh boy. Um, so with the video, with that helicopter shot uh, from like, you know, this kind of industrial, but obviously American, North American yeah. wasteland, you were sort of thinking, what the fuck? And then suddenly they're playing and it's massive dry dock. And you're like, oh, you know, I was 11. <laughs> it was, yeah. It was Debbie Harry and Clem Buck, you know, that oh, man. What that dude. man can, I, I just listened to it before I came on just now, uh, really loud because I can, I'm down the bottom of the garden. Um, and fucking hell, he beats the crap out of those drums. But, yeah. He beats the crap out of them in such a again an, arre a, 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 an arresting way. So he'll do things that you just that surprise. He's a constant surpriser, you know, um, Clem Burke as a, as a percussionist. But he never overpowers the song. No, like if you again like dreaming, like the the, the urgency of the drumming on dreaming's fucking ridiculous. But yeah. it works. It doesn't sound like some kind of prog dude having like a, a five minute wank on his <laughs> drum kit. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it Whoa. works perfectly. And like, and he looks fucking cold constantly. He's always, <laughs> I know man, those suits, that hair. I was just, I'm, I'm a, well, I'm a lapsed drummer, but I'm, I was, that was kind of one of the things that made me want to play the drums was yeah. watching him. Him and Roger Taylor were the two kind yeah. of like, I mean, Roger Taylor was mostly the spectacle because he had that, I had Queen Life Killers and he had that, there was a picture of this, just this fucking huge backlit drum kit, you know, and you're like, I want to hit that. Um, but Clem Buck with that, just he had a small, you know, two, two toms and one floor tom, but just what he did with it was yeah. just awe-inspiring. Absolutely. And um, the very first time I, I got to play a drum kit was my, my dad's, pal's brother was in a band and we went I can't remember why but dad took me along to their band practice one day and I'd never been in a rehearsal room and the smell that rehearsal rooms have that smell of Mr Sheen mixed with sweat and uh, and uh, th that was what hit me first and then he had a big red 
premier kit, just like Clem Burke's. But not only that, there was a massive poster of Clem on the wall. Nice. I was just like, oh, with the same kit, you know. And that was the first time. So that just, you know, that just made me an a drummer for a while. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that song, the way she sings through, you're right about that he doesn't overpower the song because th- she finds a way through the, it's the same on, um, it's the same what was I listening to uh, earlier on. Uh, oh, I can't remember, but she, she has this way of finding her way through the song um, uh, that, are, that kind of perfectly complements what he's doing because he is yeah. the, pretty much the next biggest thing to the vocals 100%. in each song. He's a big drummer, I think, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, what a band, man. What an album that album is, Eat to the Beat. That was my first Blondie album. Oh, what a, a cracker that is. And, and you know, you, you can't underestimate how much of an impact Debbie Harry had on young lads, on <laughs> any lads, uh, you know. I know, you know, I know. It was like, wow, because for me, that was... The first pop star I saw that, you know, I, I would look at your Madonnas and things like that and think, oh, yeah, beautiful. And but Debbie Harry was cool. Yeah, Debbie Harry was just wouldn't take shit. She just looked like yeah. she was just everything. Like yeah. she just had so much swagger. I don't think there was a cooler person walking the planet. No, than at that point, Debbie Harry was bossing it. I love that picture of her and uh, Bowie and Iggy Pop. Have you seen that one on the sofa? And they're both kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Of course you are. <laughs> Absolutely. When you think of like the ego and testosterone and stuff that must have been floating around CBGBs and she just glided yeah. through that place. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. the height of punk, she was just forefront incredible and, and unafraid to kind of un, unafraid to march forward as well because a lot of the those guys at cbgbs they they kind of you know they were albeit fucking amazing bands they, they she kind of you know because they all took the piss when they sort of heard they realized that she was going in a not a disco direction but oh, yeah, you can but think you can say that yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are well. I mean, atomic and you know all that Art kind of glass. Of they're disco and bangers. Of glass. Yeah, exactly. But 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 didn't lessen the band's impact or artistic integrity at all. Yeah. I don't think you know. Not at all. Not at all. Well, let's stay in those formative years, Mark. The song that reminds you of your time at uh, secondary school, I believe. Secondary school. Well, if it was primary, it would have been Gre- the soundtrack of Greece. That's. Brilliant. I'll say that now. Um, I can remember singing. Uh, which one was it in the playground? Oh God, I can't remember. It must have been. It must have been Sandy or uh, anyway. Um, but secondary school. Well, first of all, um, I've, I've given you two, haven't I? Um, because I just couldn't. It, it was unfair to choose because there was uh, there was two very. Even though heavy metal was a kind of a background, believe it or not, to all this and, and has remained so. You know, I'll still I'll still put on Slayer, I'll still put on um, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 here you go again, eh? <laughs> thingy with the thingy, the guy that's got the thingy. Oh, I can't even mind his name. The um the live album, if you want blood. Right. It's one of the best live albums of all time. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'll still put on ACDs, I'll, put, I'll still put on Slayer, and they were always a backdrop, not Slayer, but um, you know, Made in DC, Kiss was a big one for me. <laughs> Just the th- I loved anything theatrical, basically. Yeah. So, uh, Adam and the Ants Ant Music, when that appeared on, again on top of the pops, and it was the video, and here was this guy, um. And this is probably I, I, this is probably the next best thing to punk. This got me at the right, you know, I was maybe twelve by then. Um, so when I saw Adam Ant um, with uh, his culturally appropriated white stripe um, and his, you know, pirate garb and the little things in his hair and that kind of angry look in his eye, mischievous angry look in his eye, that really you know, floated my 12 year old boat yeah. and uh, yeah, really kind of, um, uh, I, I, that was, the, that was one of the first albums I bought, I think, 
Queen, Queen, uh, Queen's Greatest Hits, I remember I had. And I think that, but that was the one I actually kind of, I think that might have been a present, but, you know, um, Kings of the Wild Frontier, I actually went out and bought. But I just think that he, he kind of um, struck a, 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 there was a fine balance between, because I mean, <laughs> there, were, a, a, there was a lot of kids my age were into them. Um, but looking back now, because, um, you know, I listen to this stuff, my kids are 10 and 6, so I mean, a lot of the stuff they listen to now, I'm sort of like, what? And I go back and I go, well, what was I listening to? I shouldn't be so judgmental. I go, no, Matt, the stuff I was into was really good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but even Adam and the Ants, although on the surface they can appear sort of poppy and stuff, he, he, st- he was still a brilliant lyricist and quite sort of evocative and poetic, um, you know, th- songs like um, Ants Invasion, you know, was a really kind of weird um kind of good you know peroni was a great guitarist mm. i think it really Usually. helped mm. yeah and he- helped him uh, adam find his uh, voice as much as he did you know um I and mean, you can tell i mean but when they when they split up he he wasn't as good you know <laughs> on his own fully Our, formed pop star then at that point wasn't he i think like the, yeah the, yeah, yeah it's difficult wasn't it I think it was really uh, think... weird. I was chatting to my wife about Prince Charming last night, mm. and and you know I, you instantly think of Dinah Dawes and the video and and, and yeah. all of that, but it's no amp music. It's no amp music. We're, the fire's kind of gone. Mm. I, I think it's they they very for some reason very quickly became a parody of themselves, um, and I don't I, you know who knows. I've not. I know there's a there's a documentary, and he's he's written a book as well. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be really good. I mean, he's had a hell of a journey, hasn't he? Um, yeah, he really has. But he was. He didn't drink and he didn't smoke. Uh, he was oh. he he was just desperate to be a pop star. He just wanted to be a pop star, and yeah. and that's the thing on that, that documentary that really kind of comes through. That like he just wanted to be famous. Like he just wanted to be a pop star, and. Yeah. And obviously he achieved that, you know, a uh, uh, really, really high level. And and I think when that was taken away, I think that's when, you know, things started to get tricky for him. But as we've seen over the last five years, he's back looking as cool as ever now. Yeah, he is, isn't he? I follow him on shows. Instagram. And he's got his, he, he, looks, he looks brilliant now. Yeah, man. yeah. Um, but I mean, I, a... I was probably going to see it. I never saw them live. I was just that bit too young or I missed them or whatever, but... Um, I'd probably go and see him. I mean, I'd, I'd probably I'd be the oldest man in the room, I'm sure. But oh, maybe oh, I'd, not. I'd doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> I think though, as you know, as a young lad, like again, like you know, we, we, I think we're very close uh, in age. But like, turning on top of the pops and seeing like Adam Ann was like wow. You know, that yeah. wasn't a that, that you know. I can only imagine that was like seeing Bowie ten years previously or whatever. It was like. Yeah. Such an impactful look and sound, and you know the two drummers. It was like, what's going on here? Yeah, you know, because yeah. it sounded quite tribal, didn't it? It was like yeah. really, really strange. And and yeah, and he just looked... unplug the jukebox and do us all a favor. You know, that music's lost its taste. Yeah, you know, it, it said kind of everything to mm. the punk would have said to the you know three four yeah. years earlier to all those guys. You know, um, it, to, it said that all to us at that time. Yeah. So you're singing uh, the hits of Greece in the playground uh, as a young lad. Um, <laughs> so you know what? I got my 10th birthday, I got a, a tub of brow cream and a PVC jacket. I was that into it. I absolutely loved it. Brow cream's got a lot to answer for, actually. <laughs> I uh, I used to do the same. I used to kind of, when I was in the bath, I'd always kind of like flick my hair back and try and get the little curl yeah. And I think it was like a hybrid of wanting to be Danny Zuko or the Fonz at that point as well. Like... Oh, Fonzie <laughs> Fonzi lasted the test of time as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you enjoy your time at school? Uh, I moved around a lot when I was at primary school, so I, I, I kind of had to um, think of my feet a bit. Um, why was that? Why did you Why did you move around a lot? But, um, my dad was a my dad was an artist, and he was a he he, um, he worked for the um, development corporation, a couple of development corporations at the time. That there was um, there's five new towns in Scotland, and um, uh, they were sort of just being built when my dad um, uh, graduated from art school. 
Um, and the development corporations uh, employed artists to work alongside planners and, and architects to help with the, you know, um, the look and the aesthetic of uh, the new town. Um, so it was quite a novel, uh, interesting and sort of, in some ways, revolutionary idea, you know, um, and and it, it, it made for um, uh, art that still kind of still exists now. I've just actually just done a, a documentary about um, uh, about it with my dad um, a few weeks ago. We we went round all the new towns in Scotland and and um, talked to various politicians and historians and and other artists about their art and about what it, and residents as well and, uh, and what it means to them and. You know, um, uh, and its history, and uh, and the effect it's had on on art um, in general, sort of uh, moving forward from those times. So that was one of the reasons that we moved around. Was Dad? Um, it was a short contract, so he would work. He worked for uh, Glenrothes in Fife. We were there for a, a year where I started school. Then we moved to East Kilbride, um, sort of uh, kind of near Glasgow, um, and that was uh, for about six months or a year so again I went to a different school there and then eventually we moved to Stonehouse which is sort of in between Edinburgh and Glasgow um, and I, that was from our ages of about uh, eight to eleven so I was there for the sort of or seven to eleven maybe I was there for the sort of biggest chunk of time and that was the playground where I was singing um, <laughs> to try and impress whatever girl it was so was you so <laughs> Confident in that respect, like because changing schools. I mean, I, I never had to do that, and I, I the, the thought of it would have terrified me. So, was you confident enough to sort of start a new school and and kind of sort of throw yourself out there a little bit? I don't remember. I mean, I think primary. It, uh, I think it just kind of happened to me. I, I I didn't know. You know, I didn't have any say or choice in the matter. I mean, the biggest the biggest wrench actually was going from Stonehouse when I was uh, at the end of primary seven, which would be year six here, um, going to uh, going to Edinburgh to go to secondary school. Um, so that was the that was a really because I had I, by that time I'd forged a good uh, friendship, uh, um, uh, my best friend Stuart um, McLaren, and. Um, he uh so so we you know that was kind of weird um um uh, and kind of upsetting you know i remember being quite emotional about it um uh because i you know i, I hadn't I mean, the last time i'd moved as i say i was seven or eight so you kind of like you're not really forged you're not really connected in in that way to a place or people at that age um so yeah but I, and, and when i went to secondary uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I've got the piss ripped out of me <laughs> quite a lot for my accent, mostly because it, my accent was more West Coast. So I was a wee bit more like that. All right. I used to speak up and down like that quite a lot. But so, uh, yeah, after about a year in Edinburgh, it kind of flattened out a little bit more. Just sort of <laughs> in the um, but uh, but yeah, it was um, it's, it wasn't it, it, I didn't find it hard. And I guess I was always I, I used I was always quite adept at arson about you know because if you can make people laugh they won't swing at you you know yeah. um so yeah and i'm still doing it and they're still not swinging as yet <laughs> <laughs> okay track or oh, where are we four first record uh, you remember buying from a record shop please mate oh well that's uh that's my metal roots coming out um so it was 90 no wait a minute was it 99 pence? I want to say it was 99 pence. Anyway, I think it was either 99 pence or 79 pence. Uh, but it was Run to the Hills by Iron Maiden. Again, that theatricality, I think there's a, there's a theat... I love a, a band that has a sense of the theatrical. Um, and there's arguably, well, no bigger um, theatrical metal band than Maiden. Um, but I think also that... It was the first, it was my, I think it might have been, although I can't remember, but it might have been the first sort of heavy rock record that I'd heard. Um, and again, Top of the Pops responsible for all these things, you know. Um, 
but that video, that wristband that he had that went all the way up there was just like, what the, and his tight trousers and his hair and just his kind of, his swagger, Dickinson's mm. swagger, uh, even though he's a bit of a tit now. Uh, what, what is it with all these fucking, what is it, Morrissey, fucking Ian Brown, you know, Bruce Dickens, you know, f- why does it have to happen? I don't is know, it, mate. Is it, is it a sheltered life? Is it, is it, is it kind of, you know, you, you suddenly find yourself up there on this pedestal? Well, Morrissey's always been a bit, a little bit fucking weird, but, but yeah, you've. Uh, but we didn't see that yeah. coming, though. The stuff Morris. that he started to. Oh, mate, I'm smothered in Smith's tattoos. It breaks me up. Mate, mate. oh, I, oh, <laughs> mate. Well, listen, they, you know, when we get late, I didn't put. There, there's none of them in there. Mm. I just find it too hard. But um, um, they were, uh, for, for about three or four years, they were, you know, I saw them in 86. Oh, wow. Um, on the Queen is Dead tour. And um, yeah, one of the best gigs of my life, you know. Um, uh, and I, I love them so much. I still yeah. love Mar. I think Mar's such a fucking great guy. When love I set this up, that. I have one, well, I had two guests that were like, I've got to get to speak to these people. And one was Johnny Mar. I've not got there yet. Oh, I'm you working will, on that. You, <laughs> you will, you will. Are you He's best just, in people? So cool, aren't he? Oh, he's the best, man. He's the best. And he's a, you know, when you listen to what he was doing, you know, you know, because it used to, well, when I got in at them, it was all, it, not all Morrissey, but, you know, it was it was what he was saying. It was those fucking lyrics um, and the humour, you know, that everybody always fucking misses or, you know, people who don't fucking know or care go, oh, yeah, I'm so miserable. You go, no, no, no. <laughs> cool. yep. um, but then as time goes by and I don't listen to them a huge amount but I have listened to them a wee bit in preparation for this because I thought well I'll go back and, and what difference does it make was on the best intro for a while as well because I mean there ain't no better guitar riff really than that right. special and it's so it's so short but it just makes you go oh! yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but you, when you listen to what he's doing in those songs, you know, you go, wait, he's kind of uh, ethereal. A lot of the stuff, you go, where is he? Well, I can't quite work out the guitar. You know, it's not in your face. It's in and around, beautifully in and around everything, you know? Oh, man, they were a band. (laughs) Oh, mate, really were. And like you say, and Morrissey lyrics that just spoke to you as a a teenager, do you know what I mean? And like, uh, and then... The stuff that seems to be coming out of his mouth that the press are jumping on, it's like, I can't get my head around it. I just think, is this some elaborate Morrissey joke that we're not getting? I don't know. No, but, yeah, it's like, it's it, but, it's not, but it's not funny. No, it <laughs> makes it's no joke. fucking sense. No. I know. It's just, and Bruce, Dick, I, I, I didn't know that Bruce Dick, uh, Bruce Dick, <laughs> Dick was a, 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 a Brexiteer. No uh, way. Then, uh, yeah, big one. And uh, I, I saw a, a, um, an interview. There was a, Sky News, I think, interviewed him, which I, I saw on uh, Twitter. Somebody posted on Twitter a few weeks ago. And he was like going, he was, he was, he was saying, I can't remember what the interview was even about now, but it was, I think it was about the lorries or the shortage of this and the shortage of that. And he was sort of going, I don't understand. Why can't we just get, you know, we got it. And I was like, you fucking. And he was arguing, say, you know, I'm a, people know I'm a proud Brexit voter. I was like, I didn't, you fucking arsehole. Thanks for just scrubbing another. F- uh, so, yeah, because I find it really hard. I know you've talked to guests about this before, but I find it really hard. And I know Adam Buxton does it a lot when he talks about separating the, the art from the artist, you know, being able to kind of tease those two things apart so that you're not fucking thinking about what's going on while you're listening to the music or looking or reading or whatever it is that they're responsible for. I find it very hard ever since, um, not ever since, but I, um, I also to add into the fucking mix, I'm a, I was a massive Queens of the Stone Age fan and um I went to see them about four or five years ago at Wembley Arena, and they were just, it was an unbelievable because they were so good. And the whole play, you know, when you see 10,000 people doing that, it's the most thrilling fucking thing. Um, 
Then, like, the week later or two weeks later, he kicked that photographer in the face. Did you see that? Yeah. And that, I've never, I I, I never put them on. I can't can't do it, you know? I was just like, oh, you're a prick. He tried to make excuses for that, and he's like, mate, you can see it. He just kicked someone in the fucking face, man. Yeah. He leaves his foot out when he's turning. He knows what he's doing. You know, I'm having problems with this, with that, with drugs, whatever it is. I don't know. I can't remember what he said in his apology yeah. now. But it's like, you know, I just don't get, I don't get that kind of behaviour. And it's it soils, unfortunately for me, probably, but it soils. I can't just, I can't get out the present person uh, with what they did in the past, you know. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, I can't get it out of my head. It's a shame. Yeah. It's a good title for a song. Can't get out of my head. <laughs> Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Iron Maiden. Yes. Yeah. Well, so that's how, what, why metal? How, how did metal find its way into like what was it you liked about? Um, you mentioned the theatrics of Dickinson, but yeah, and I, I don't guess you could say the same for Kiss. But like, did you like that kind of aggression in music? Um, yeah, I've yes, I've I've always liked that kind of. Um, I, I, I think Tony said that when when you when you spoke to Tony Pitts, he was saying about um, uh, I can like anything as long as somebody means it, you know. And I guess that was the first thing that came into my sphere of listening, where somebody fucking seemed to mean it, you know. Yeah. Um, usually because they're screaming at the top of their voice, or there's some kind of maze like busy lit going on, or but ACDC, I think were the. Uh, I think let let's let's get it up was the first sort of either that or run to the hills I can't remember but it just it kind of yeah it was one of those moments where you go it was thrilling you know for a for a young boy um, and uh, and uh, it just yeah that theatricality and okay yeah kiss man I remember putting on like shows miming to kiss for my grandma um, with. <laughs> We covered the we covered the floor in uh, newspapers, and we got the two sort of uh, bedside tables. I think me and my brother, and stood on them. And um, we, I'd bought blood, blood capsules from the joke shop, and we uh, mined to Detroit Rock City or something. I don't know what it was for my grandma. Grandma who was looking after us, who was very posh and wore a wig, and you know, oh dear, dear, dear. And uh, I thought she'd be the most shockable. Um, but she just sort of st- <laughs> fuck knows what she would have made of that. <laughs> I'm going to put on a show for you, Grandma. <laughs> so yeah, I forced my wee brother. Oh, he he liked it. He, he's he's still he's a big Maiden fan. He's a bigger Maiden fan than me. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that sense of the theatrical, I think, really appealed to me, uh, and that pomp and circumstance, but also like, you know, fucking hard ass. Yeah, I can roll. <laughs> but you, 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 I mean, I still think that that finds its way through in in things like Faith No More that we've just mentioned as yeah, well, course, and, yeah. and Queens of the Stone Age. It's like, it, yeah, it, it's not fucking around, is it? And but there is a no. rock and roll theatric to it as well. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's it's almost inherent in rock and roll, isn't it? Really, I mean, you, you when you choose what chords you're going to write a song with, you're making a statement yeah and and i think a lot of those bands i'm not i'm not a really I, I don't musically know what i'm talking about really but you know a lot of those bands in their you know it, it's inherent in the music that theatricality i think you know yeah um, and i love it i love it i love i love a i love a great front man you know yeah there's nothing Absolutely. more thrilling than watching a really good front man or woman mm. The song that soundtrack your years clubbing. All right, okay. Um, and now I've put um, this. This could have gone anywhere because clubbing and me um, didn't really. I mean, I was never a regular clubber for a long period of time. Um, so it happened in sort of pockets. So at one point on this list, <laughs> at one point on this list was. Um, uh, do you remember a song called Male Stripper by Man to Man? It's a 
fucking great record, man. <laughs> I good, fucking it? love that record. It's like, a really fucking good dance record. Yeah, man. Like, um, but that hell. almost made this list because there was a time when I used to... I would, when I wasn't pal, my, my best pal um, in the world is called Keith Taylor, and he, me, and him make collaborative Spotify mixes all the time. We've been doing it for ever since it became a thing on Spotify. So we've got about eighty, but on eighty something, I think. Um, and um, we used to go out to this club called Lacuna Head, which was in the Carlton Studios in Edinburgh. Um, but before that which is where the, my song choice comes from. But before that, uh, I used to, like a couple of years before, I had a good pal called Leslie, who I used to go out with. And I went out with her and all her sort of female pals. And at that time, I had a black Mohican. And uh, I can't remember why, um, but I, I can't remember what possessed me to have a Mohican and dye it black. Anyway, um, and I used to wear eyeliner and harem pants. And uh, I, was, I was kind of a... a toying with new romanticism sort of after it happened yeah. um, I think or maybe not, maybe it was about the time I think I, I, I liked a lot of again that theatricality you know so Spandau Bali in the early days when they had their big fucking sashes on work till you're muscle bound and all yeah. that you know um, and Adam and the Ants of course and uh, um, but also uh, the Smiths were vaguely on the horizon but uh, I, did, I, I sort of you know I just thought it would be cool to have like you know a, a bit of a different look so I did so I went very different and I used to go out with clubbing with them but I can't remember what the club was called but that was the song that was always on was Neil Stripper yeah and I was always fucking up dancing to it I loved it um but the song I've chosen isn't that um it's um it's what goes on um by Velvet Underground because when we went to look in ahead um and that was probably the most elongated and the, the place, I, the club I visited the most. It was a great fucking club, man. You would have loved it. It, oh, it, had, um, it was just like loads of fucking dry, uh, not dry, uh, smoke everywhere. And uh, just, and lots of chemically inebriated young people. <laughs> and I just, I, 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 so most of the time, the, the, the musical memories from that aren't dancing. They're sitting at a table a listening to fucking the Velvet Underground or Dinosaur Junior or Butthole Surfers or 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 fucking all manner or Husker Do or you know all these amazing fucking bands that were around, but listening to that and just blinking and going and and rushing, <laughs> you know, just fuck it off my tits. Going, <laughs> this song is probably the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> And that, that um, sentence will be repeated every three minutes, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold on a minute! <laughs> you know, it was... Uh, and, and what goes on was one of those that they played sort of every week, I think, you know, and and um, whatever chemical it was, it seemed to, it seemed to um, bridge <laughs> whichever. It didn't matter what chemical it was. The Velvets were always a fucking great listen, you know. Wonderful. So that's that's the that's the uh, yeah Lacuna Head man. That Carlton Studios is gone now. I saw Nirvana there in uh, in ninety one about two, about two weeks after Nevermind was released. Wow. And so it was a uh, Lacuna Head was upstairs at Carlton Studios, and um, and the the gig the the band the venue was downstairs, and it was a. Uh, like the capacity, what I think was supposed to be eight hundred or something. There was two thousand people. They just like fucking crammed them in, you know. So it was like that. But fuck, I was right at the front, you know. I was staring up Kurt Snow's. It was just fucking incredible. Abs, and I, it was at the peak of my love for them as well, you know. Yeah. Oh man, I love that you, band so much. Have you gone back and and like slung on Nevermind like recently? Not recently. I, <sighs> I've, my, the way I listen to music is quite, because uh, I, I know you ask this question and I often think I'm like that. Um, I don't, I don't make it down here very often. This is my, that, there's my turntable, you know, I don't make it down here too often to just put on an album anymore. Yeah. So it's usually I'm doing the dishes and I've got my headphones on uh, before I have to go out and read a story for the kids, you know, so, yeah. so it's like a couple of songs at a time. Um so I haven't put on the album, uh, no, not recently, but I've listened to various songs from it. I know most, I, not most, but they 
of all the songs that I know how to play on a guitar, I know the most I know are Nirvana's, you know, because yeah. they're actually quite simple songs to play yeah. and you feel like you're achieving something in quite a short space of time, you know. He's a great, great songwriter, I think. Oh, a, a brilliant pop songwriter as well. Like, yeah. never mind, yeah. every song is just hooks. It's so catchy. Every single one, you're right, aye. Everyone. It's um, amazing. And, uh, you know, someone that, uh, you know, DJs in, in an alternative club and has done for nearly 30 years. Like, <clears throat> you know, there's times when I never, ever want to fucking hear Teen Spirit or Lithium ever again. But about two years ago, I went out for a walk like everyone was doing in the early days of, of, of being locked in. And uh, I've, I, I've been lucky enough to get to interview Butch Fig on here. I've listened to it. And, uh, oh, what a genuine... He chose Teen Spirit, didn't he? Uh, he <laughs> mentioned, it was it, it was almost an honourable mention, but he didn't go for oh, it. Okay. Uh, um, but, I mean, every right to, do you know what I mean? And, yeah. uh, and oh, fucking hell, we done Smashing Pumpkins and Sonic Youth. He could choose all manner. Oh, that's you know what true, I, mean? I, I know. Like sugar cane. Oh, <laughs> like, um, but he... Uh, but I, I just, afterwards, I thought, I'm just going to listen to never mind. And, and I went out and I just put it on. And I've heard that record... 130,000 times. But I just put it on again and just try to sort of listen to it with fresh ears. And I honestly think it's just perfect. Like, there's Drain is my favorite. I love yeah, Drain. I love like, Drain that's an intro. Like... Oh, <laughs> Territorial Pittons is an intro oh. as well, though, man. Oh, seeing that on Jonathan Ross. I know, you, uh... I know. They were supposed to be playing what they were supposed to be playing because he introduced it as. Was it like meant to have or... been uh, Come As You Are? Oh, Come As You Are, that's right. And then everything went mental. Yeah. Like, oh! <laughs> oh, man. What a... that... See, that was another punk as well, I think. Mm. You know, um, even though his, his sort of sensibilities arguably were, weren't quite that because he was slightly more kind of... His, his, his lyrics were always slightly more... Um, less of a call to arms than maybe a lot of punk lyrics were and he was more he was poetic he just he, I remember him saying he just liked the way that he, he liked painting pictures with words um and you, that yeah if you give yourself up to that it's 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 what he takes you on an amazing journey you know yeah. um but yeah sh what a fucking tragedy eh? um but uh yeah who knows where we'd be if he was still around well there's room really, isn't there that there's a uh... There's a record that, that's never going to see the light of day that Kurt and, and Michael Stipe wrote together. Uh, what I'd give to hear that. Like, yeah, because yeah, apparently, like, like you know, he reached out to Stipe. So I think R.E.M. was like a, a massive, massive sort of love of him. Uh, uh, and, yeah, and apparently, I think that the track on Monster, Let Me In, is written about Kurt. Um, and so in and around that time, yeah, I think like they were they were working together, and and I guess at the time, REM were the kings of that kind of acoustic mandoliny thing, and obviously Nirvana had just done Unplugged. Like I don't know if it's going to be in that vein, but oh, I'd love to have heard anything that them two might have worked on so together. Aye, fucking hell, man. Mm, yeah, I, I had no idea. I've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. He's got it, and has Michael Stipe got it? And he's just. I don't know. I, I, I imagine he's probably got some kind of uh, hold on it if if it does exist, as you know, as the rumours have it. But you know, another incredible vocalist there. You know, underrated vocalist oh, Michael Stipe. Yeah. Uh, did you watch? Have you watched them? Um, Song Exploder, you know, or well, it's a podcast as well, isn't it? I love that show, man. That's so good. Hearing they, 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 they did uh, um, losing my religion, didn't they? On that, yeah. Just I, I'm a fucking geek for shit like that, Mark. Like me too. Seeing them just taking it down to just the strings. <laughs> I and, like, know. You just think, oh man, I love that. Somebody was talking about the McCartney and um, uh, Rick Rubin thing. McCartney three two one is it called? But I've not uh, heard that. Oh, I think it's called McCartney three two one or McCartney one two three, but it's McC it's Rick Rubin taking McCartney through. I don't know if it's like a selection of the old stuff. It must be a selection, but um, yeah, and it, it's exactly that. It's like taking it down, wow. going, so "What's that? What's that noise I can hear there? Who played that?" And it's McCartney, and apparently it's just fucking delightful because McCartney obviously just is you know in love with that whole time, you know. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, there's a there's a wee recommendation, man. Because I'm I'm can't, I can't wait to get my hands on it. I think it's it, I don't know where it's Netflix or oh no, it's Disney Plus. It's Disney Plus. So if you have access, I to have it, got yeah. that. Have you have you listened to McCartney on Buxton? Yes. Oh, love yes. that man. You could hear that Adam was almost nervous at the beginning. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I love. I love Adam Buxton. Oh man. Yeah. What? I worked with Joe. <clears throat> I did. I did um, uh, the kid who would be king. You know Joe's mm. film. I did a wee a wee bit in that, and uh, as did Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I kind of, and I was a little bit. I mean, I was never. <laughs> I only, you know, I've been doing this twenty five years, and I only had about I don't know four four lines in it or something. But I took it because it was him and I took it because uh, I hadn't done much film, you know, and I thought, well, it'll be a good wee credit on my CV, you know. Um, but uh, but it was it was just great. But I was so fucking nervous before I started. I was like, oh, my God, because I've been listening to Adam and Joe for fucking years, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I'm a big fan. And I, I, I've, I always listen to, to Adam's podcast as well. You know, I think he's got a, a, a real ability to kind of... Um, I don't know to get to get wonderful conversations out of people. He's the best. He's the absolute best. Yeah, he really is. And I will listen to people that I'm not really that interested in because I know that it's still going to be great because it's Adam. Yeah. And and I don't know if you listened to the Nicky Wire episode. I did. Yeah, that was brilliant, wasn't it? That's amazing. And wow. I'm not. A big, I've never been a big manic fan. But um, but it was superb. It yeah. Just, uh, yeah. What he what he. The com the way the conversation went yeah. um was just uh, it was really fascinating. I'm gonna take yeah, you home. Yeah, go on. Track six. Favorite song from an artist from your home county, please. Ah, oh no, I'm cheating slightly here. Um because because Jerry Rafferty's for Paisley. Mm-hmm. And I've never really lived anywhere near Paisley. But I know a lot of people make the mistake of, oh, I thought it was country. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, but um I, I'm kind of using I'm using the sort of Glasgow because I've lived in Fife and I've lived in Lanarkshire. It's near enough, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll let you this, have it, mate. I'll let you this have is it. Another, this is another song that uh, a, a very recent kind of um, uh, song on my sort of musical horizons, but it's re- it really made a, a, a huge impression on me. It's called Whatever's Written in Your Heart. And I, I know that. Um, I've heard Billy Conley talking about Jerry Rafferty really in in a beautiful way, and and I obviously knew who he was because of uh, Baker Street and stuff. Um, but and I can't remember how this song came in into my kind of like um, world. Um, I think somebody might have put it on a mix or something like that. But I think it's just the most beautiful, simple incredibly you know uh, incredibly crafted song you know it, it's it, and the lyrics are just so heartfelt and so um you know whatever's written in your heart uh whatever's written in your heart is all that matters you know it's it's you'll find a way to get it out someday it's it's it makes me cry because i think about my kids when i listen to it to be honest with you yeah um and i think well you know, if you want to say, well, you want to say many things to your kids to arm them for the future, but that that's one of them, you know? That's a beautiful sentiment. I've never heard anything other than Baker Street, I think, until uh, I was prepping for this and had a listen. Uh, stop me in my tracks. It's, it's stunning, isn't it? Yeah, it's really oh. properly beautiful. Mm. Properly beautiful, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's much more you can say about it other than just listen to the bloody song because yeah. it's, it's just, it lifts you to a, and this is what all great music does. It lifts you to another place. That's what that Louis Armstrong song does. Um, uh, it takes you somewhere you've never been before, be that emotionally or spiritually or you know, whatever, it, just, it should it should lift you up out of yourself uh, and enlighten, you know, yeah. the best, the best of music. Yeah. Um, 
and that and that does that i think well mark's last track and this is where you get an opportunity to turn someone onto something new a song that many may not know that you would like them to hear please yeah this was hard uh this was hard too um <clears throat> Uh, because, the, well, because, fucking hell, there's, I don't, you know, first of all, you're presuming that um, the majority of people haven't heard what you're about to say, but but this, again, is another new, um, uh, new-ish one on me that Keith, uh, in one of our mixes, he put on, and I was like, what is that? And uh, it's called, it's called um, uh, Palante, and it's by Hooray for the Riff Raff. And I think it's, I think she's Venezuelan. Uh, and and Palante uh, means forward, um, and it's just uh, I mean it kind of starts off. I love songs that kind of start off in one place and finish in an entirely different place by way of in this middle section that there is. It's a kind of Beatlesy, a weird like Sergeant Peppery kind of feel mm -hmm. that boom 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 you know there's a wee kind of odd middle not eighth middle fucking 32 but um <laughs> it got, and she sings another wee bit there and then suddenly at the end it moves into this 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 kind of full of this this full of grandeur moment where she shouts forward Forward, brothers, to my brothers and my sisters. Forward to my mother and my father. Forward. You just think, wow. That's, again, you know, although she comes from a completely different place than I do, the sentiment is is human, you know, and 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 uh, universal, you know. Um, and I just, I, it always, it, it gives me, and I'm, I'm getting them now, talking about it, but it always gives me goosebumps, you know, up my, yeah. up my back. And I love songs that do that, you know, yeah. when you just think about them, not even when you hear them, but when you think about a song, you go, oh, yeah, there's that bit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's what an amazing thing to be able to do. To people, yeah. Know? There's a thing um, that uh, apparently Michael Jackson used on one of his last records. And, and I was working with this. Uh, I, I was talking to someone that was producing this. Oh, what was this band called? They had an incredible name. Oh God, that long ago. But um, like it's like talking to myself still. Oh fucking hell, mate! <laughs> <laughs> but um, but they, they, they've got this kind of the, these frequencies, and and that this gets put into the production, which apparently triggers goosebumps. Uh, oh really? Yeah, and it's just it, there's a kind of science behind it, and because not everybody gets goosebumps, do they? That's it's not like. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And and what, whatever it is with this kind of thing that they, they've they've been working on can kind of induce and bring out like a, a goosebump like kind of reaction to, to something that, Jesus. Like, that, that that's uh, that's at equal times amazing and really fucking pisses me off as yeah. well. Yeah, it Some should be an emis that's... emotional response, right? I know, I know. Don't fucking try and trigger me. But yeah. that's what people do. That's what musicians have been and, and actors and fucking artists and whoever have been trying. And then you do down the club, you know, you're, yeah. doing, you're putting on, you're thinking this is going to really fucking rock their world. Yeah. You know, that, that Absolutely. Kind of, Absolutely. Yeah, that's what you want to do is make people happy, doesn't it? So Absolutely. Well, we've got a great um, playlist to be listened to uh, over on Spotify now, Mark. And we've put all your honourable mentions on there as well. Um, so people can go and explore everything nice. we've, we've, we've chatted about today. Um, I knew this was going to be a, a really nice natter. Oh, and, me, it's and, been an absolute joy. Oh, thanks, mate. It's been great. And uh, and I'm going to keep you on the call when I press stop because I want to ask yes. you something anyway. Okay. But, but, Mark, thank you so much, mate. I mean, but also, what's, what's coming up? What, what What's next oh, for you? Uh, well, um, uh, in, well, I'm, I'm working, this is why my, hairs like this but um i'm doing a I can't, I can't tell you about it but i'm doing a job just now which you can't tell you about um but that is very exciting um itv four-part uh, drama but um uh, next well imminently is the second series of guilt um which is uh due out sort of i think uh, 
just over a month away or thereabouts. Uh, October, I think. Okay. I'm safe to say that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you get to find out um, all about what's happened to Max and Jake um, uh, since the end of Series 1, since I got taken down. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, that's very exciting. And um, I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of uh, The Rig, which is a new Amazon um, sort of sci-fi kind of uh, great story by David McPherson. And the new uh, the new series of Shetland will be out fairly soon as well. So um, there's there's lots been happening. Um, uh, so yes, it's uh, it's good. Long may it continue. Touch wood. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, guilt is the most imminent thing. Okay, and if people want to kind of keep up to speed on on everything about this, Instagram the best place to keep up to speed with you. Yeah, Instagram and Twitter. I'm on them both. I don't. I don't. Uh, you know, I don't check them uh, as often as I probably should. But yeah, you can catch up with me there. Wonderful. Mark's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so Enjoy much, me. mate. My pleasure.